Okay, a word before we begin about last week's lecture. My wife made fun of me for wearing these glasses. They're gaming glasses, and they protect my eyes from the harmful stuff coming out of the computer screen. I'm a freelance uh, editor and writer, so I stare at a screen all day long and all night long sometimes, and uh, these keep my eyes uh, from getting fatigued, but she thinks they're so ugly that I can never wear them again, at least on camera. And then the hat. I'm bald, and uh, <laughs> I'm afraid that the light uh, reflecting off my head would be a distraction. So I'm keeping the hat. Okay, on to the lecture. Okay, we're going to talk first about the Jewish sources which refer to Jesus, and then we're going to talk about the um, the pagan sources that refer to Jesus. You know, a lot of people um, will present to you, or actually they presented to me, um, historical proof that Jesus existed. And part of that proof is uh, the Jewish sources. And that, and we're going to talk about the reliability of these sources. Um, Flavius Josephus lived from 37 to 100 CE, and then the Babylonian Talmud. That's two Jewish sources. Okay, Josephus is uh, our source for much of the li much of life in ancient Palestine. Um, you remember, or you're going to read about how the people of Galilee wanted to forcibly uh, crown Jesus or make Jesus their king. That kind of happened to Josephus. Um, he didn't really want to participate in the war against Rome, but he was uh, conscripted, basically, to be a general for the Galileans. And whenever he surrendered to, I think he surrendered to Augustus, um, he was so, the, whoever he um, surrendered to, the, the Roman soldier, the Roman ruler, um, the Roman ruler was so impressed that he brought him back to Rome, and Josephus lived in the court. And he wrote histories of the Jews, and he was an apologist for the Jews. He was trying to convince the Romans that Judaism was a legitimate religion, and it was healthy, you know, and that uh, Romans should not kill Jews. Um, he's known most for wars, antiquities against Appion, and being a Jewish apologist to the Romans. Um, these are all works, independent. He wrote Jewish Wars, that's a book, or several books. Antiquities of the Jews against Appion. Appion is a Jew, uh, not a Jew another Roman, sorry, uh, there are stuff written, there is stuff written by, against Jews, um, and being a Jew, Jewish apologist, so uh, he just sat and wrote all the time, and he doesn't write in very good Greek, so if you have to translate, don't translate Josephus, translate Philo, and uh, he says in book 18, section 3, paragraph 3, in antiquities. He says Jesus, and he calls him a wise man, and that is almost universally recognized as genuine. That means that people who study this stuff all the time somehow have come up with assurances that Josephus actually wrote this. Now there is another section of the antiquities where he is talking about James, the brother of Jesus. And, oh, I got this backwards, and I'm looking right at it. Uh, the Jesus, a wise man, is universally rejected as genuine. And the theory behind that is Josephus would not uh, talk about Jesus so highly. And, and then the James, the brother of Jesus, is considered genuine. I got that messed up. Okay, now this is the entire... Um, the entire section of uh, the first quote. 
And he says, About that time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. That's why people think that he didn't write it. For he was one who wrought surprising feats and was a teacher of such people as accept truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Messiah. You know, the thinking is that this was interjected into the text by a Christian scribe at some point during the history of this text. The Christians are the people that preserved this stuff, and uh, they wanted to make, make it look like a Jewish intellectual like Josephus uh, would accept Jesus as Messiah. Uh, modern scholars are not convinced. And here is the, yes, the full James quote, which people think that uh, Josephus actually wrote. Since Aeneas was that kind of person, and because he perceived an opportunity with Festus having died and Albinus not yet arrived, he called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. And you remember Sanhedrin were the ones in control of the temple. They were the, the wealthy guys that were in charge. He brought James, the brother of Jesus, who's called Messiah, along with some others. He accused them of transgressing the law and handing them over for stoning. So this is the story of James's uh, martyrdom. It's considered genuine. Okay, pagan sources that refer to Jesus, and I think we're going to reject all of these as evidence for the historical Jesus. And I'll tell you why. Uh, Pliny the Younger was a, an aristocrat, was a rich guy that wrote a lot of stuff. And uh, in Epistle 96, he mentions Christians who worship Christ. He doesn't say anything about Jesus. He just says Christians worship Christ. I mean, obviously. Tacitus was a historian, and he wrote Annals, which is, a, which is a history, and he describes the persecution of Christians in Rome, but he does not affirm the historicity of Jesus. But Tacitus knew that there was a Christus who was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Suetonius in the lives of the twelve Caesars, talks about the persecutions of Christians under Nero and the expulsion of the Jews from Rome because of Crestus, which is this Crestus guy. Um, and that is not Christ. Um, with Suetonius here, he talks about persecutions of Christians. He does not talk about Jesus. Okay, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we already went, went over this, I believe, uh, but I, I think we should talk about it anyway because it's been a while. Um, Jesus' ministry in Galilee is the focus of the Gospels. Um, the story of his betrayal, arrest, crucifixion, and resurrection are central. Um, only the feeding of 5,000 is reported in all four Gospels, so that's a very important story. And there's a concentration on the kingdom of God. That is, God is going to right all the wrongs and establish a new kingdom. John's gospel is unlike the synoptics. Instead of focusing on Galilee, uh, he focuses on Jesus' ministry in Judea. He mentions the kingdom of God only once, so he doesn't have that same focus as the synoptics. And his concentration is on who Jesus said that he was, the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, now, literary criticism simply means uh, that you're going to study the literary nature of something and... Uh, see what it says, and, and trace the history of it. Now, there's a synoptic problem, and that problem is 
which gospel came first, and why are they so similar? So you have to you have to think, uh, did Mark come first and Matthew and Luke depend on Mark? Um, did they all share the same source? Um, did Mark write his independently with source Q and Matthew and Mark, Matthew and Luke copy Q and so on and so forth. You know, it's just as convoluted as you could possibly get. Now, the problem is, again, almost all of Mark appears in Matthew in shorthand form. Half of Mark appears in Luke. And then Matthew and Luke share about 235 verses. So these works have a lot in common. Okay, solutions to the synoptic problem. The old theory is that it's called uh, the mark in priority, where Matthew and Luke pre just simply preferred mark over other sources, and that's why um, they're so similar. Another solution is there was an original sayings gospel. Now, it's a collection of sayings, and it's not a document. It's called Q. Form criticism of the Gospels. It asked about the transmission of the stories, and it divided the Gospels into literary units. And those units are pronouncements, miracle stories, parables, stories about Jesus, eye sayings, and legends. And this impacts your interpretation because whenever you're reading it, you don't interpret a pronouncement in the same way you interpret a parable. And you know where the parable begins and where the parable ends and how it fits into the larger uh, framework of the gospel. And the stories about Jesus you're not going to interpret like the legends. So uh, the next step they do is they interpret these sections within the situation in life of the early church. That is, we study the, the Jewish background, the Greco-Roman background, the background of what we can know from the church fathers and from the rest of the Bible, and we develop a situation in life, you know, a context of the early church, and interpret the pronouncement within that, interpret the I saying within that. And a lot of times, I believe, the Gospels tell us something about the community. You know, if it's, if it's a story about comfort, the community needed comfort. If it's a story about um, the kingdom of God coming, they might be persecuted. You know, so that's what people do. Okay, more on form criticism. The interest of form criticism was in the practical context that produced and transmitted the early traditions. And that means the practical context in which the person wrote it down and then how it was handed out, transmitted. And, and the transmission goes all the way to today, the, trans the transmission history. So uh, they're, they're uh, focusing on something that's very pragmatic. And the miracles of Jesus were very succinct. That was a discovery of form criticism. Um, teachings were preserved because they answered questions. You know, like I like I said, you know, the the teachings or the uh, the sections of the Bible uh, that they identified on on the previous slide, they are preserved because they saw the problem in the that the church had. You know, the these texts of the New Testament continually solve problems and answer questions, and that's why it's so important to us. And there's also uh, the identity of the struggle between Jewish and Gentile culture, which we're going to talk a lot about. Okay, Matthew. And the Gospel of Matthew 1 means this is the first slide on Matthew. Um, now, Matthew was written to convince Jews that Jesus was a royal Messiah. And uh, you can tell with, just with that, there is a desire 
to unify the church. You know, the Gentiles believe and the Jews now should believe. And once everybody, once everybody believes the same thing, uh, all is going to be well with the world. Uh, Jesus is born in Bethlehem, the city of David, which is an argument that he's the Messiah. And Jesus has an inaugural address. You know, he has a, he has, he's going to be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords, so he uh, gives a Sermon on the Mount as his inaugural address. And the Gospel of Matthew, again, concerning with Jews, and lineage of David, uh, we mentioned earlier, appeal to Jesus as the fulfillment of prophecy. Now that's very, very critical, because the Christian church, ever since the birth of the church, we try to connect ourselves with the Old Testament. And a significant connection is the fulfillment of prophecy, especially prophecies concerning the Messiah. So Matthew approaches the Messiah as someone born of a virgin and ministering in Galilee, preaching in parables, and so on. So Matthew is concerned with bring Jews into the community of Christ believers. The Gospel of Mark is my favorite gospel. Um, I had to prepare to translate from, from Greek without a dictionary or any other tool uh, any passage from the Gospel of Mark uh, for an exam. And so uh, I know Mark inside and out. And I love it so much um, that I cry every time I come to the point where Jesus is betrayed by Judas because it's his friend. You know, Judas was a disciple of Jesus for three years, and they've been through tough times, they've been through good times, and uh, Jesus loved him. And uh, that betrayal is just so complete. Because everyone flees, and Jesus is alone, and it's haunting. Someone who's done so much good is now friendless, and it starts with Judas. Well, the Gospel of Mark was written for Gentiles, unlike Matthew, which was written for Jews. Mark translates... Hebrew and Aramaic sayings. These are the two languages that Jews usually know, especially Aramaic. But Mark translates them into Greek so that the Greek reader can understand what he's saying. He also translates numistic terms into Roman equivalents. Now, that means that uh, numistic is money. It means that he doesn't use the Arabic reckoning of value. He translates it, translates it into Roman equivalents, uh, which is a very good argument together with the translation of the Hebrew and Aramaic. Pretty certain it's written for Gentiles. Now, there's a date in authorship that's based on the fragment of Papias, and I've discussed that in our timeline video. Okay, the Gospel of Mark. There's a concern for what Jesus did, and not so much for what he said, especially about himself. Mark is a very uh, fast writer. Uh, you know, the impression of the immediacy. You know, he always says, and then this happened, and immediately this happened, and immediately this happened, you know, over and over and over again. So you just get the sense that Jesus is rushing from place to place, doing all the good he can do before he is crucified. And the events are important rather than the discourses. Discourses are teachings. You know, it's more important that something happened than the teaching behind it. So he's very, uh, I don't know the word for it, but he has a different way of thinking than the other Gospels that are concentrated on teaching. This is a third slide of Mark, Mark 3. 
there's an emphasis on the humanity of Jesus. And that's expressed when Jesus asks questions. You know, God knows everything. And we have to have, if you have to ask a question, you don't know something. So that is a, it's a really beautiful aspect of Mark. And then Jesus shows emotion. He has grief. He expresses anger and amazement. You know, stuff can take Jesus off guard. And um, he doesn't really have control over himself. He gets mad. So, and he also sleeps. And he is ignorant of God's plan. You know, um, it's a pretty awesome emphasis on Jesus' humanity, especially in a time when Christians were focused on the divinity of Jesus. Mark also has an emphasis on the divinity of Jesus. Uh, he says the Son of God a lot. But you can tell he, he emphasizes humanity a whole lot more. But Son of God. Gospel of Luke. Now this is this is great. Uh, it's written for educated Gentiles like Theophilus. Now Theophilus paid for Luke to write the Gospel of Luke and also Acts. And one of my discussion questions is, what does that mean? You know, does it mean that Luke is influenced by Theophilus? And maybe Theophilus um, dictates some of the events in a way that pleases him and not in the way it happened? Because patrons of literary clients, that is writers, they often uh, meddled in the affairs of the artist. And the artist would retaliate. So there could be instances in Luke that are meant to embarrass Theophilus. Um, I doubt that, but it's, it's possible with the kinds of relationships people had back then. Now, the Gospel of Luke has the most elegant Greek of all the Gospels. I think that's a matter of taste, sort of, but it really is the uh, best style. Uh, you know, there's ways of writing in Greek that are uh, easier to read because they have things like articles, like A and V, and you can tell if something is singular or plural. Um, you know, there's a lot of times when Greek it can get its wires crossed, and, you know, they could make mistakes in their grammar. And whenever you make a mistake in grammar, it's, it's almost impossible to interpret it. You know, you just have to guess. Um, there are very few quotes in the Old Testament, of the Old Testament. Uh, the New Testament quotes the Old Testament quite a bit. But it's, uh, it's curious that there are not as many quotes from the Old Testament, and that probably means that it wasn't written for Jews. Um, Luke is the only author who refers to Jesus as master rather than rabbi. And master is closer to Gentiles. And it's, he seldom uh, references to prophecy. You know, he's not concerned with connecting Judaism and Christianity through fulfilled prophecy. And then instead of using the Hebrew word amen, he uses Greek meaning, Greek word meaning truly or verily. You know, very, verily, I say unto you. A lot. Now, there's also a social aspect of the Gospel of Luke. Um, there's an emphasis of Jesus' importance for all races and social class. And he does that by tracing Je Jesus' lineage to Adam. And, that, and Adam, you know, of course, is a first man. And so it's a unifying aspect for Jews and Gentiles. Or it just focuses on Gentiles because it doesn't trace, uh, Luke doesn't trace Jesus' lineage back to David or even Abraham. And he says, and those are Jews, you know, fathers of Judaism. And he says, all flesh 
So see the salvation of God. And there are no restrictions of the apostles to the Jews. That is, Jesus doesn't tell the apostles to stay in Jerusalem or to only preach to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. Women also have a prominent place in the followers of Jesus. I think that's true with all the Gospels. You know, they are patronesses. You know, they support Jesus. They uh, help Jesus. And, uh, you know, of course, Mary is important. Okay, it's a social Gospel sometimes. You know, we've already seen uh, some, of the, some of the social aspects of Luke. You know, based on you know his importance for all races, traced it to Adam, and including women, and no restrictions um, to the Jews. And it also has something that's very powerful: is Jesus, his, Jesus's humanitarian concern, that is his empathy for the poor, oppressed, and the outcast. You know, um, a lot of people think that the social gospel is bad. You know, it's an emphasis on uh, you are expressing Jesus' love as you help other people, namely the poor. And so it's gotten a bad rap because some conservatives think that, they, that uh, serving the poor saves you. But, um, you know, and I mean that as a criticism. You know, the conservatives say these social gospel guys think that they're saved through their works. Uh, I don't think that's the point at all. Uh, it reflects Jesus' concern for other people. And empathy. Another thing that's very cool is uh, in the Sermon on the Plain, which is an equivalent to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, it ends with, be merciful, not be perfect. So, it's be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful, and not be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So it's a it's an inclusive statement. And then there are woes to the rich and powerful. Gospel of John uh, it has a very distinct style. Um, it's fun to read in Greek because it's easy. Um, the Style is also is kind of um, philosophical rather than religious. Uh, you know, he focuses on theology and not on basically anything else. Um, the emphasis on discourse, that means the teachings of Jesus. And there is a distinct theological interest. Okay, the style... Is simple but profound. Uh, you know, in the beginning was the Word. You know, that's a profound statement. Or, I am the bread of life. But, thankfully, you know, I've always been glad that John has a limited vocabulary, which means I have to memorize less words whenever I'm reading it. Uh, and it's very easy for elementary Greek students. Uh, because John knows how to write in Greek correctly. Not all of the New Testament writers do. Okay, this is the third slide about John. Um, this is about the emphasis on the discourses of Jesus. Now, it's very divergent from the, from the Gospels on chronology and other historical data. John is not a historian. John is a theologian. He doesn't really care about events. You know, he can just make stuff up. Or he can write in a very interpretive way and not so much a historical, factual kind of way. You know, John is our artist. Um, he is the rogue, the person that sees things differently. And he organizes it in an extremely intellectual way. And... Um, like we said, it's powerful. Um, his interest is in theology and not in chronology. That means he's interested in thinking about God, theology. 
He's not interested in history. That's chronology. We know from uh, John, but, but, you know, this is, you're always an exception. We know from John that Jesus and other disciples were followers of John the Baptist. Now, that's very important because people say that Jesus was a disciple of John, John the Baptist, and he just uh, outgrew him. You know, uh, Jesus was different. You know, he whenever he got baptized, John saw the dove and heard the voice from heaven, and then Jesus started his ministry. Um, there are possible independent reports in John uh, of uh, Jesus, you know, direct stories from people who are really close, and uh, it's very, that's very difficult to find in John, though. Okay, his theological interest, um, he begins with theology rather than genealogy. You know, he begins with that wonderful statement, in the beginning was the word, and um, the other gospels start with the genealogy of Jesus. You know, they trace Jesus back to uh, David or back to Adam and in an attempt to legitimize Jesus as the Messiah. But uh, John begins with the theological statement. And he believes that Jesus is a climax for God's plan for the world. You know, the uh, Jesus is the beginning and the end. And Jesus represents the life that one can have with God. You know, Jesus is the bread of life. He's alive in the world. Um, he's do, he is doing miracles in John, and most importantly, he believes Jesus believes that the kingdom of God has come, and that means God is making things new. And because of that, because of that belief, Jesus participates in the kingdom right now. You know, the kingdom of God is here, and the kingdom of God is coming. And between that time, those who believe can actualize that higher level of being. And John is saying that we can have that life with God that Jesus has. You know, we're not going to be Jesus, you know, but we can experience that wonderful presence of God and delight in God's perfect plan to make everything whole. Now, there's also the teachings that Jesus is the bread of life, the light of the world, the resurrection and the life. Those teachings are far more important than where Jesus was. You know, we went to city to city, you know, he, or um, the order of his ministry, or even the even the crucifixion. You know, there there is a a lot of freedom that John takes because he's emphasizing on these other theological uh, points. Okay, now this is uh, on the date and authorship of the Gospels. Very little can be known about this because every Gospel is anonymous. Uh, we don't know really who wrote Gospels. They were just handed down and passed around so much by the early Christians that the names were, you know, the authors' names were lost if they even had names to begin with. And uh, it became a tradition pretty early on, you know, which gospel was which. You know, it didn't just appear like in the 5th century. Um, all of the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, all of them are on the uh, codex, early codex, that I showed you earlier. So it's something that's ancient, but we can't quite get all the way back. And the review of the early Christian writings timeline is a timeline that I have in the timeline section of the course, and you can view that at your convenience. Okay, there are even more sources on the life of Christ. We covered the uh, Jewish sources and the um, pagan sources, which are basically worthless. And uh, there are memories of Jesus 
in the Christian Apocrypha, in later extra-biblical stories of Jesus, and uh, in these extra-biblical sources, uh, the lost years of Jesus are very popular. You know, the Gospels don't tell us what happened between uh, Jesus' birth and whenever he was uh, in the temple at about 12 years old, you know, challenging the uh, scribes. And Christian Apocrypha is different from the Old Testament Apocrypha, but it is essentially the same. It's the same idea. You know, these are writings that were used by early Christians and probably attributed to the apostles, but they weren't written in Greek or they just weren't circulated enough and they didn't make it into the canon. And extra biblical simply means uh, stories of Jesus that aren't in the Bible. There are many Gospels that uh, were written by Gnostics and by other groups and by Christians that um, talk about who Jesus was and what he did that uh, are sources on the life of Christ. Uh, not reliable sources, but sources nonetheless. Okay, summary of the life of Christ. Um, I think everybody is familiar with this, but we'll just go through it anyway uh, because, uh, you know, introduction to the New Testament. Um, the summary of the life of Christ. First he's born, and then we're going to skip all the way down to John the Baptist, who, who may have been his mentor, and then he was baptized, and that was the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and he's immediately driven out into the wilderness to be tested by the devil, or by Satan, and at least according to the story. And he passes that test, and then he and then he returns and has a public ministry that was wonderful. And then there's the final week of his life, which is Passion Week. And, uh, you know, it's the entering into Jerusalem and the triumphal entry, having the Last Supper, uh, getting betrayed, and finally being crucified. And then he was resurrected and ascended into heaven, according to the life of Christ in the Gospels. Now, John the Baptist. We're going to start with him because he's right after the birth. Okay, he lived in the wilderness, and by wilderness we mean um, he, he lived out in the boonies, away from everybody. He was a holy man. Uh, he enjoyed, at the time of Jesus, Jesus' adulthood, um, popularity. You know, it says in the Bible that people were flocking out uh, to get baptized by John and to hear him teach. Uh, he did a he did a one-time baptism, which means that, you know, whenever you're baptized by John, you get baptized once. And that is a baptism of repentance, and you don't ever need to do it again. Now, other groups practice daily washings, daily ceremonial washings. You know, you remember in the Gospels, uh, the Pharisees will have to stop and and uh, wash themselves in a ceremonial uh, washing and, you know, doing that before a meal. Um, and the Essenes also did it every day. So it's something that's uh, sort of unique. Uh, he taught that the day of Jehovah was at hand. Uh, God is going to come and destroy everything and it was going to be the end of the suffering of the Jews. Everybody is going to uh, be on God's good side, and people should repent of their sins to prepare for this new kingdom. The baptism of Jesus tells us that he was a disciple of John the Baptist. And then you have disciples of John the Baptist moving over to uh, learn from Jesus. Um, he was baptized by John. He supported John's message. And so, uh, why was Jesus baptized? In the according to the scripture, it was you know obedience to God and start. He's starting his ministry. He is uh, being born anew, and 
um, you know, just kicking off his life of obedience to God as a minister. The temptation of Jesus, like I said, was immediately after his baptism. There were three temptations. One was a temptation to turn stones into bread and be the bread messiah. One of them was uh, the temple. Uh, he was going to throw himself off, you know, Satan told him to throw himself off the temple to, if he was really the messiah, and God would save him. And Jesus said, you're not going to uh, tempt God. And then the kingdoms. Satan promised all the kingdoms of the earth to Jesus if he just bowed down and worshipped him once. And that is a temptation to become a popular Messiah. And Jesus decided uh, not to succumb to any of those temptations. Okay, the public ministry of Jesus is divided into three years. It's kind of uh, amazing that he accomplished what he did in only three years. Uh, the year of obscurity, the year of public favor, and the year of opposition. We're going to talk about that. Uh, year of public favor. Uh, he's going around the countryside healing people and preaching the good news and teaching his disciples, and he's harassing religious leaders. You know, Jesus being the rebel, um, he is winning lots and lots of converts, and life is good. And then there's the year of opposition. And uh, he has, he increases his harassment of religious leaders. And then he rejects the elaborations of the law of Moses that they had. And he rejects their teachings concerning the Sabbath. He openly opposes religious leaders in the second year. And uh, he becomes a little more vapid against them, and openly rejects their teaching. Okay. I guess I didn't get the year of obscurity. Um, that would be the third year, and I think. And uh, that's the year we don't know very much about. It's obscure. Uh, and then the final week, uh, we talked about this a little earlier. Uh, it starts with the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So he's acting like a king. You know, he's entering into the cheers of the people. And uh, that must have been a beautiful sight. He also cleanses the temple. That's the turning over of the uh, money changers uh, tables. He does some public teaching and some engagement with Jewish leaders, but not very much. He predicts the destruction of the temple, which happens, uh, you know, in 70. And then he has the Last Supper, Passover meal, and he has a prayer in the Mount of Olives. And the arrest, trial, and crucifixion of Jesus is very complex because everything happens so fast, and some of it is illegal. You know, like the Sanhedrin meeting at, at night. And, um, you know, not having a proper trial before Pilate. And it's just a mess. But it makes it more believable to me, you know, because everything wasn't done according to the letter of the law. And uh, that makes it kind of like life. You know, life doesn't really happen the way it's supposed to. But Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss, probably a kiss on the cheek. It's a, a greeting of affection and love. He has a trial before Caiaphas at night, which is not legal. And the he says that I am, I am that you know the Son of the Blessed. And uh, Peter denies him three times. which is actually moving. And not just because of the three denials, but whenever Christians, at the time of this writing, this thing was written, the early Christians, um, incidentally, we know this from 
Pliny the Younger, that, who we cited earlier as a source for Christians uh, and not for Christ. But anyway, Pliny tells us that uh, he captures two slaves. He's a governor of a province, and he captures two slaves and tortures them until they tell them where the Christians are being. The Christians have to deny Christ three times before he executes them because he wants to make absolutely certain that he is dealing with real Christians and not just people who had a conversion experience and they're, they're sorry now. Um, and what happens whenever the Christians deny Christ three times? What do we do with those people? Because they're not killed. All the true Christians are being killed and the um, the ones that didn't have the backbone to uh, die for their beliefs didn't love Jesus enough you know um, what is the church to do with them so we have the story of Peter's denial where Peter denies Christ three times and he should be out and uh, there was a argument in the early churches about what to do with these um, with these Christians. Should we accept them back into the group or should we not? You know, are we going to forgive and let them in? Or are we going to not forgive and, and keep them out of the community because they you know, they did something horrible. You know, they, they gave up their brothers and sisters uh, just so they could live a little longer. So uh, this is a very real problem. And the New Testament goes both ways on this. In some cases, when people deny the faith, they're accepted back in. And whoever did this, whoever preserved Peter's denial, they're saying they take the they're saying that the person at the top can mess up and be welcomed back. So the people at the bottom can too. It's a very powerful story with a distinct context behind it. Then there's a trial before Pilate. Barabbas is let go. Jesus is crucified or condemned. He is scourged, which basically means all the skin is ripped off of his back with bone and, and hooks, a whip. He carries his own crossbeam to Golgotha, which is the place of the skull, and then Jesus is crucified. Now, on crucifixion, you don't survive it. You know, some people think that uh, his disciples took him down off of the cross and he lived and he wasn't really resurrected. The Romans knew how to execute people. And crucifixion is just as impossible to survive as a bullet to the head. It's just slower. Now, whenever Jesus died, it was a death of hope. Which means all of his followers, especially the disciples, have nothing. Jesus is supposed to be the Messiah. He's supposed to um, bring order back to Jerusalem, kick out the Romans, you know, cleanse the temple, um, be an awesome warrior. And whenever Jesus died, that hope was gone, you know. Jesus had been healing, he'd been walking on water, being the Messiah. And then everything is gone for the disciples. Now, when uh, Jesus was resurrected, it's the true hope of the kingdom of God being here on earth. And his resurrection is a pattern for ours in Christian theology. 
Now, according to the scripture, Jesus lived after 50 days of ministry. He ascended back into heaven. Okay, this is this is also something that is uh, really powerful. Early Christians really, truly believed this. They really believed that Jesus rose from the dead. You know, in a real way. You know, his real body resurrected. And this is the foundation of the Christian faith. Without the resurrection of Jesus, we have nothing. Or Christians have nothing. So one belief that you can never let go of and uh, still be a Christian. Um, at least in the sense of the history of Christianity. Without the resurrection, we continue without hope. And that's the end, folks. Uh, thanks for listening to week two, and I uh, hope to see you on week three. Please let me know if you have any questions. Um, I'm available to you easily by email. And have a great day.